Well, interestingly, the insurance guy has the least amount of science in his, uh, in his presentation. I'm not sure if that's what you were expecting or not. Um, what, I, what I'd like to talk about today in the time that I have, uh, uh, to start with in just a couple of slides, I'd like to make the case that uh, climate change is right now. So, uh, you know, notwithstanding the models that indicate that uh, the impacts are going to become much worse and much more severe in the future, we're feeling the impacts uh, immediately and have been for some time actually. So I'll try to make that case in, in two slides. You'll be convinced or you won't, but we'll, uh, we'll see where we get to there. And then I'd like to dive into a, a bit of a case study uh, specifically related to flood risk in Canada um, and a, uh, really a, a consortium of the, of the willing, a coalition of the willing that have been, that have been focused on this problem uh, and uh, use the winning conditions that that uh, group has have come up with to have a conversation about uh, my view, the cooperator's view of the role of the insurance industry uh, in climate change in general and in the, uh, in the issues associated with flood specifically. So that's the, uh, that's the intent. So to start with, um, I'm gonna, the data that I'm going to show you here is through an insurance lens, but it's not intended to be focused on insurance. This just happens to be the lens and the, and the data that, uh, that I'm most familiar with. So these are large catastrophic losses in Canada. They're all adjusted to uh, $2,012. Uh, the data is accurate up until almost the very end of 2013. Uh, we had some bad weather at the end of 2013. You might recall if you're from... Uh, if you're from Ontario at least, uh, that would make 2013 look a little bit worse than this. So these are all brought to, to 2012 values and you can sort of see, I think I had a pointer here somewhere, that's going to work. You can sort of see that there's a period of time where we're kind of ranging around, you know, 400,000, or sorry, 400 million per year. Um, we have the ice storm in, in Quebec and Ontario, but clearly there's a significant increase in in major event losses in 2012 dollars in the most recent years. And this can't be explained solely by the increase in ec economic activity, uh, the increase in values, et cetera. It can to some extent, but there's something going on here that, that is clearly, uh, clearly significant. And again, through, uh, through the insurance lens, um, I've stolen unmercifully this slide from uh, my good friend Paul Kovacs, um, but at least have left the, uh, uh, left the recognition there. Um, so to make a couple, of points on, a couple of points on this slide, essentially what this is trying to say is, or trying to indicate is that the change in losses uh, over a long period of time associated with fire, so that was uh, typically the, the most important peril uh, from an insurance perspective and the prevalence now of, of wind and, and water claims. And so if you think about the major events on the previous slide, well, it's climate change that's happening here. It's this, this storm activity is rapidly, uh, rapidly increasing, having a significant economic toll. The one thing that I should point out about these two slides is that these are only insurable losses. So the economic impact, according to the government of Alberta, of the single event in southern Alberta in 2013 is in excess of $5 billion. We're only capturing, for the entire country, $3 billion in insurable losses. So this problem is much bigger in the Canadian context than, than this lens shows. Uh, but the important thing is that these are the trends that we're, these are the trends that we're seeing. So, from my perspective, looking through the insurance lens, climate change is right now. Uh, this is not something that, well, it is something we need to worry about in the future, but it's also something that's having a significant economic and significant other impacts uh, on our society right now. Oh, the last point that I'll make, and I'll come back to this in a, in a moment, is that you might wonder why the data ends uh, essentially at 2010 on this graphic. And it's because my industry has decided in its infinite wisdom uh, that we're not going to share this information anymore. And so it's not, uh, it's not publicly available in the, same, uh, in the same way that it was previously. So hang on to that thought. I'll come back to that in a moment as well. So what I'd like to do now is dive into the case study. And uh, uh, Dr. Blair Feltmate is here, who's played a, a significant role uh, in, in this work. Partners for Action is the label of a, of a group that uh, has been loosely formulated. I'll, I'll call it a coalition of the willing. Um, many, um, 
uh, many of you in this room were actually at the round table in, in June 10th, um, but I want to back up a little bit. Uh, the cooperators uh, started in 2000 and, well, the end of 2012, thinking in earnest about uh, the flood problem in Canada. And we started thinking about it from the perspective of the role that insurance should play. Uh, and so, you know, as uh, what role should we play as an organization? What role should the industry play? And we uh, worked with, with Dr. Feltmate and his colleague at the University of Waterloo, Dr. Thistlewaite, um, and requisitioned two studies. The first was a study that focused on the insurance industry and the question was, you know, what would it take for flood insurance to be available in Canada? And when we got the responses back from that, uh, from that study, we quickly, quickly realized that this was a problem that required uh, a much broader coalition and a much broader solution than could be brought to bear simply by the insurance industry. This is a societal level problem. And so uh, we engaged a much broader group you can see some of, the, uh, some of the participants on that list with a broader question of what are the winning conditions uh, if, if we as a Canadian society were to be effectively dealing with this growing exposure? What are the winning conditions that would need to be in place for us to be successful at, at managing, at adapting to uh, climate change in general and the flood risk associated with climate change specifically? And what are the key priorities? What are the actionable items that we could, that we could focus on? Um, so I, I, I needed to set this up so I could talk about the winning conditions, which comes next. Uh, but both of those studies are uh, publicly available. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want access to them, you can certainly uh, connect with me and I'll provide them. And I'm sure, I, although I haven't asked him, I'm sure Dr. Feltmate would, uh, would be happy to provide that, that information as well if you, if you don't already have it. So you can see quite a broad... Uh, quite a broad group of, of leadership from Canadian society were involved in this discussion. And we came up with um, what in retrospect seemed like three almost a priori winning conditions, but it took a great deal of, uh, a great deal of work and conversation and discussion and deliberation to come to these. And, and this fir the first one is where this, in, this whole discussion about uh, climate data comes into focus in terms of this case study. So the first winning condition, P4A, is Partners for Action. Canadians understand the risk that overland and urban flood presents to their homes, businesses, and communities. Well, as we've discussed today, we need the science to be able to do that. We need the modeling to be able to do that. Um, the data may or may not be available, but it needs to be in a, available in a way that, uh, that can be effectively communicated, which gets to the second winning condition, and that is that Canadian decision makers use their understanding of flood risk uh, to make sound adaptation decisions aimed at protecting their homes, their personal safety, their businesses, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that's been a good part of our discussion today as well. Um, so in a very micro sense, uh, David mentioned earlier that he really wished that someone would have told him the hailstorm was coming when it was really quite known that it was coming. And uh, I'm not, David, I'm not sure where you are. I'm not sure if, I'm not sure if. <laughs> it's been crushed long ago. I'm not sure if you're a client of, uh, of the cooperators or not. This is a shameless pitch, by the way. Um, <laughs> But we've actually been sending out uh, text messages and uh, Facebook blasts and things like that um, when there's hailstorms, when there's major events that are, that are coming, saying things like, you know, a storm's coming, it might be a good idea to put your vehicle in the garage. Um, the, uh, I could probably use some help from my friend Colin here, though, in that uh, we tend to only get to about 15% of our clients um, uh, with, that, with that information, which is really, uh, which is really unfortunate. Uh, but that's an example at a, at a micro level of, of the decision making that Canadians can make. At a macro level, it could be you know, governments making major infrastructure decisions based on a much better understanding of the risk that their communities are, uh, are exposed to. And finally, the last bullet there is that Canadians have access to a means to transfer the risk associated with flood damage uh, that remains after adaptation. So that could be a private insurance solution, that could be a government solution from Partners for Action's perspective. Uh, it really doesn't matter, but what does matter is that Canadians have that have that access. So three very simple statements, um, you know, sort of easy to conclude, very difficult, very difficult to implement, and uh, data specifically uh, is very relevant to being able to accomplish these. So 
uh, switch back to the cooperators branding here for a moment and I want to spend the majority of well all of the time that I have left actually uh, really diving into our view of what the insurance industry's role could be uh, or should be uh, in terms of uh, uh, in terms of this work so in terms of in terms of understanding the risk uh, the science of insurance really is about monetizing risk uh, that's the that's the baseline behind it. And it's my belief that one of the most important social benefits of insurance is that monetization. It's that, it's that economic signal that uh, provides a, a basis for good decision making based on the risk that, that you're exposed to. And we don't do a very good job of this as it relates to the flood peril in Canada now, quite frankly, because it's not covered. Uh, so, you know, there's, there is not, there's no flood insurance widely available in Canada for homeowners. There are, there are a few places where on a very limited basis uh, it's available. Uh, and as a result of that, we don't provide that, we don't provide that economic signal. And we should provide that, that economic signal. Um, now, what I can say in terms of the cooperator's work is that uh, this level of modeling to create the understanding is, it's very doable. Um, we have a group that's been working on this problem for about, uh, for about the last year. And in the areas that we've been focused on, uh, and the areas that are in highest risk within that, within that geography, we're actually able to estimate the average damage per year uh, due to flood and rain events at a household by household level. So we've been talking about uh, geospatial grids that are in you know, the 30 kilometer range and perhaps wanting to get down to, uh, to a much finer range. Um, for this application, we need 30 meter grids. Right? We need to know in the 100 foot by 100 foot lot what the damageability is and what the, what the estimated damage is. Um, so I'm, I'm telling you today that's doable. Um, that, that, is, that is something that is, is readily doable with the, right, uh, with the right tools and with data that is, that is available now. Now what that doesn't do is it doesn't create the future models at the 30 meter by 30 meter square, uh, but it creates the current state in terms of the, uh, in terms of the risks, that, in terms of the risk that's there. And so the, the second point I think we've, has been touched on a number of times today already, and that is Canadian decision makers need this, need this understanding. I think we must have said in various ways, shapes, and forms 10 times today that uh, there isn't the impetus, the momentum, the, the business case, if I use terminology that I'm, that I'm more for, familiar with, to provide the funding to build the modeling um, to, do the, to put the programs in place, whether they be infrastructure programs, educational programs, et cetera. Um, that's been sort of a reoccurring, a reoccurring theme. And I believe strongly that one of the ways that we can make those business cases real is by creating that monetization. So if, if we know, as an example, that the average flood damage in a given community, a given, prom a given province, um, is you know fifty million dollars a year, five hundred million dollars a year. When you start taking into account all of the return periods that are um, that are reasonable, that now gives us the basis to be able to support a business case to build an infrastructure project to adapt to that, to mitigate the flood damage, to adapt to the climate change, and. I think there's a significant role for insurance to play in that space because uh, we, have the, we have the background, the capability, the expertise to monetize, to monetize that risk. It's not a role that we have played, I would argue, effectively, uh, but it is a role that I, believe that, we, that I believe we need to play. Great opportunities for the insurance industry to partner with municipalities, as an example, share data, share modeling, um, and better understand how to uh, impact decision makers, whether they're individual homeowners or whether they're policy makers in, in government or in business. And finally, from a risk transfer solution perspective, um, it, see, it seems clear to me that there is a, uh, a dire need for, uh, for flood insurance in, in Canada. You saw the graphic earlier that showed that, um, uh, that wind and water damage was now outstripping fire damage in terms of insurable losses. And uh, 
you know, so this is a, a bit self-deprecating from uh, in terms of the industry that I'm in, but I'll say it anyway. Uh, I think I think you would find it ludicrous if I were to stand here today and tell you that uh, PNC insurers in Canada were not going to insure fires in homes. That would that would seem like a ludicrous thing to say. Uh, however, uh, your homes are more at risk from water damage than they are from fire damage, uh, and it seems to me to be equally as ludicrous that we would um, that we would have a situation where. Uh, flood insurance was not was not available, so that's a that's a problem that we as an industry uh, certainly uh, certainly need to solve. So I'm going to pause there. Um, I, I think the uh, the case study is focused on flood, uh, but the role that industry can play, specifically the insurance industry can play, I think uh, can apply to climate change risks on the whole. Um, and so I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much.